Hi, I'm Professor David Atley, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Thank you for joining me. In today's mini-lecture, we'll be talking about one of the most important topics for ancient astronomers, which is their ability to understand and predict the motions of planets. And in particular, we'll be focusing on a bizarre phenomenon that proved really difficult for astronomers to explain, the phenomenon that we now call apparent retrograde motion. Let's get started. Before we can understand this apparent retrograde motion thing, we need first to understand how planets move in general. When we look at the sun or the moon or the stars, we see that they engage in regular, easily described and easily predictable motions across the sky. Basically, they always go one way. Not so planets. In fact, for a long time, that bizarre motion is the thing that marked a planet as different from a star. The word planet that we use in modern English comes from an ancient Greek word that means to wander. So anything that wandered across the sky relative to the stars, which stayed in a fixed position compared to one another, we called that wandering object a planet. So ironically, According to the ancient definition, then, the sun and moon actually were called planets. And in fact, if we look at the old style explanation of how the solar system was organized, you would indeed see the sun and moon classified as planets. Though, of course, with our modern definition, we've decided that that's not really true. For today, we'll be looking at how the things that we call planets today, objects like Venus or Mars or Jupiter, move across the sky. And they have this really bizarre dance that they do, as we'll see, but regardless of how they're dancing around, there's one thing that always remains true, and they always are found really close to the ecliptic. Do you remember what the ecliptic is? I hope you do. If not, you should go back and look at your notes. So as they travel along close to the ecliptic, normally these planets are, go, are going to go from west to east on successive nights. So they move eastward. Because of how the sky is arranged and how the sky looks, if you're standing in the northern hemisphere and looking up, by tradition, astronomers place the east on the left of sky images and the west on the right. Now this seems backwards to most of us who've ever looked at a map in geography class, but eventually you get used to it. And so what that means is that on the image on the right-hand side of the slide, Mars is moving from right to left across this picture during normal motion, and that means that Mars is indeed moving towards the east. But in the middle of that picture, Mars does this weird thing where it sometimes, or well, not sometimes, only once in this picture, but it briefly slows down, so the pictures of Mars get really close together, and then it starts going backwards. It starts moving not right to left, like normal, but instead it starts going left to right, so it starts moving to the west. And this is what we call apparent retrograde motion. And how to understand and explain this behavior that was one of the key puzzles that ancient astronomers wished to be able to solve. How can we, in fact, explain this behavior? In order to really understand this, we need first to think about some things that we can observe to be true about planets when they're undergoing apparent retrograde motion, or retrograde for short. And in particular, there are two features that are critical. The first is that planets are always at their peak brightness during apparent retrograde motion. During this time where the planet looks like it's going backwards, that's as bright as it's ever going to get during that entire cycle along its orbit. The second thing is that, with a couple of notable exceptions, planets in retrograde are opposite the, on the sky from where the sun is. So if the planet is up there when it's undergoing apparent retrograde motion, then the sun is down there. 
So they're always 180 degrees opposed to one another during retrograde. The exceptions to this are Venus and Mercury. And Venus and Mercury are weird because they are inferior planets. They're closer to the Sun than the Earth is, so they behave differently than the other uh, five planets that we can observe normally. So why does this happen? Well, when a planet is in retrograde, it's in the part of its orbit that's marked off by the circle that you see showing up on the slide. So when a planet is passing the Earth or getting passed by it, that's when apparent retrograde motion happens. So according to our modern understanding, this, what you're seeing on the slide right now, that's what makes apparent retrograde motion occur. That one planet, say the Earth, catches up to and passes another planet along its orbit and that act of catching up and passing that other planet makes it look like that planet is traveling backwards. This is a little bit hard to visualize on a fixed and static slide, though we've tried, but let's look at a simulation from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln that shows this over time. So well, let's watch and see how this actually happens. This is a simulation of how the solar system can operate if we have two planets in orbit around a common sun. In this configuration, I've set it up so that the blue planet is the Earth, and the gray planet, orbiting farther from the sun than the Earth is, is going to represent Mars. What you'll see once we get started is how Mars and the sun appear relative to the background stars, and that will show up down here in the lower left corner of this simulation. Let's go ahead and get started and see how the planets look. What we're watching now is the Earth and Mars are orbiting around the Sun, but the Earth is on a shorter orbit, so it takes less time than Mars to go around the Sun, just like it takes less time for a racetrack, or excuse me, for a race car near the center of the racetrack to complete a turn then it would take the same race car near the outside of that racetrack to complete that same turn, because when you're closer to the middle, you have a shorter distance to travel, and therefore you can complete that distance in less time. What that means is that the Earth is going to periodically catch up to and pass Mars, as you just saw. And when that happens, when one planet laps another one, that creates apparent retrograde motion. So as the Earth is lapping Mars, we're going to see that Mars will pause, go backwards, and then start going forwards again. We're getting close, so let's watch that happen. Mars is pausing, backing up, and then going forward. And as it does that, both Mars and the Sun are moving along a set of constellations that we call the zodiac. That's about to happen again, so let's watch it. Pause, backwards, forwards. So Mars periodically and briefly stops in its tracks, goes backwards compared to its normal motion, and then goes forwards again. So I'm going to slow down the motion of the Earth and Mars so that you can see this in a little bit more detail. So I'm just going to reduce the speed control and then restart the animation. So watch the Earth now catch up to Mars as it's doing that, Mars pauses, starts going backwards, and then as the Earth finishes, Mars pauses again and then starts going forwards to the left. So this is why we get apparent retrograde motion. One planet catches up to and laps another one, and it causes the planet where the observer isn't to look like it's going backwards on the sky. But at no point did either the simulated Earth or the simulated Mars really change direction. They've always kept going in the same direction. Now, let's look at this, not for Mars, but for Venus. And what we'll see, okay, let me speed that up just a bit, is that as Venus catches up to and passes the Earth, 
to an observer on the Earth, Venus is going to look like it goes backwards. See? Just did it. Did you see that? Well, if you didn't, it'll come around again in a minute. But this is important. Regardless of whether we are on the planet that's doing the passing or the planet getting past, we will see apparent retrograde motion just like this. We saw Mars and Venus do the same thing. They're pausing, looking like they're going backwards, and then resuming their original motion. Okay, we're back. So, did that make sense? Can you see why when, say, the Earth passes Mars or Venus passes the Earth, we see that planet look like it's going backwards? And hear me saying this, it looks like it's going backwards. This is an illusion. That's really important to keep in mind. And it's an illusion caused by the fact that we, the observer, are stuck on the Earth and the Earth is in motion. Okay, now let's forget all of that because knowing that relies on thousands of years of astronomical observations and very, very careful mathematics to get to that point of understanding how the solar system works. And in order to get there, we had to make a lot of mistakes along the way. So let's back up and look at what some of those mistakes were. How did, say, the ancient Greeks understand the solar system? Ancient Greek astronomy was based heavily on ideas from Plato and that were then propagated by Aristotle. And we now call these ideas, which sprang fully formed from Plato's brain, Aristotle's rules for the universe, or something like that. They don't have a formal title, but that's more or less what they are. And these ideas are based purely on aesthetics. The ancient Greeks loved them some beauty, and they thought that the most beautiful thing in all of science and mathematics was a circle. So they said that because the Earth is imperfect, they assumed that bodies out in the sky, celestial objects or heavenly bodies or whatever you want to call them, that those things like the Moon or Mars had to be perfect because they're in opposition to the Earth. So that's the first of Aristotle's rules. But that's really vague. What does that mean? Perfect and imperfect. Those ideas, especially if we're talking about beauty, will change over time and across cultures. Well, what the Greeks meant by perfect and imperfect was very specific. First, they meant that celestial objects have to be exact spheres. They're perfect spheres without a blemish or a dent or a freckle or anything. And then those same celestial objects also have to follow circular paths at constant speed. And this is something that physicists call uniform circular motion. So those are the basic rules underpinning the Earth-centered or geocentric universe that the ancient Greeks assumed was the right way to go. Now, if you're paying attention, you might have already spotted a problem. I'll give you a second to think what that problem could be, and then I'll tell you what it is. Have you figured it out yet? Well, if you've got a system based on Plato's and Aristotle's rules, you have to have planets traveling at constant speed and they have to undergo apparent retrograde motion. So what the heck? How do you do that? Well, the way that the ancient Greeks figured out to explain this was to introduce nested series of circles. So they don't just have a circular orbit for their planet, they have circular orbits on top of circular orbits. And if you engage with those loops within loops, eventually you put enough loops in, you can explain the motion of the planets. And that looks like this. Essentially, what the Greeks did is they took a small circle that they called an epicycle, and they tacked it on to the big circle that they called a deferent. So if you have uniform circular motion, so circular orbit, constant speed, for both of those two interlocking circles, by magic, you can create apparent retrograde motion even though the planet is supposed to continue along at constant speed along both of those circles. And here's how that works. This animation shows what it looks like 
if we ignore what we know about how apparent retrograde motion really works and adopt the ancient system of epicycles to explain the motion of planets across the sky. I've set it up to be configured so that the simulator will show what Mars looks like as it moves across the sky. We've got Mars sitting on a small circular epicycle, and that small epicycle is attached to a larger circular orbit, which technically is called the deferent. And then as Mars starts moving, it's going to trace out a complex path that can explain apparent retrograde motion. Here it goes. Mars is traveling at a constant speed along its epicycle, and the epicycle is traveling at a constant speed along its deferent, and the sum of those two motions creates that really fascinating loop-to-loop -loop motion that you see Mars taking that's traced out by that red path. And every time Mars goes into one of those loops, if you watch the bottom, which represents the stars of the zodiac, you'll see that Mars is going to briefly pause and go backwards. Here it goes. So just like you saw when we were looking at planets as they're configured in the real solar system, we can see a planet like Mars or Venus or Jupiter go into apparent retrograde motion in which it pauses, goes backwards relative to the background stars, and then resumes its forward motion. And it does this every time it's in one of those loop-to-loop -loop patterns. Now, let me try and pause this right at the height of apparent retrograde motion. I don't think that's quite perfect, but it's pretty close. Now, at this point, when Mars is in apparent retrograde motion, or just in retrograde for short, there's two observations that we should be able to explain if our model is working properly. The first, if you remember, is that Mars should look especially bright at this time. And we can explain that because when Mars goes into that loop, causing apparent retrograde motion, Mars is at its closest point to the Earth. And because it's closer, it looks brighter. Because when a light source gets closer to the observer, that light source looks brighter. If you don't believe me, go outside tonight, look at a car's headlights as it travels along the road. Those headlights will look faint when the car is far away, and as that car starts getting closer and closer and closer, the headlights will get really bright, and you'll have to avert your eyes so you don't get night blind. At the same time, Mars should also be on the opposite side of the sky from the sun. And indeed, we see that once again, that's true. Mars is on one side of the Earth, and 180 degrees away, clear on the other side of this simulator, that's where that little yellow circle representing the sun is. So, this model manages to explain both of the observed properties of a planet when it's in apparent retrograde motion. And that success is a big part of the reason this model stuck around for as long as it did before finally getting replaced. Okay, we're back. So we have this system that's able to explain the motions of planets, so we can explain apparent retrograde motion within Plato's rules. We can explain why planets during apparent retrograde motion behave as they do, why they get so bright. And using that system, we can predict the future positions of planets with a surprising amount of accuracy. So we have this idea, which though not simple, is at least a single idea, and that single idea is able to predict a bunch of different kinds of measurements. It predicts position and brightness and time. That's a scientific theory. This is why the Ptolemaic geocentric system lasted for so long. This system, which was started by Plato and Aristotle and finished by Ptolemy, was in use for over a thousand years because it was really, really good at doing what it needed to do. Now, over time, some problems will start to crop up, and that's what's eventually going to lead to the heliocentric revolution. But let's take a minute and appreciate 
what an accomplishment this was. The ancient Greeks and their Roman and Arab successors were able to put together a really coherent, complete, highly detailed picture of the universe, which for a while stood up to the test of time. And this is one of those very few examples of a true scientific theory, which eventually has to get completely scrapped. For the most part, what we're gonna do instead is find out that our previous theory was good, but incomplete. And we'll need to do some tinkering, but we can basically make things work with just a few minor corrections. And that's usually what happens, but every once in a while, we have to just junk the whole thing and start over. And this is one of those few examples of that happening. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me again for another mini lecture on some other topic in astronomy.